Welcome back to Destin Travel. On this episode, we're going to be covering the historic sites of Sri Lanka. We'll enjoy a traditional farmer's lunch, and we'll end the day with an elephant safari. And along the way, we'll learn a little bit about the Sri Lankan Civil War, which is the defining event in the country's independent history. This is our second episode of three, covering the pearl of the Indian Ocean, Sri Lanka. Thank you for joining us. To kick things off, let's get reoriented. Sri Lanka is an island located in the Indian Ocean, right off the southern coast of India. It's about the size of West Virginia or Croatia. The capital is Sri Jayawardenepura Kote, which is part of its largest city, Colombo. 22 million people live on the island, and the major languages are Sinhala and Tamil. Sri Lanka was a British colony for around 150 years, so many people, especially in tourist-facing jobs, do speak some English. The currency is the Sri Lankan rupee, and I would rank the country about a 3 out of 10 on the expensive scale, with one being the cheapest. On this episode, we're going to be going on safari and visiting archaeological sites. In the most expensive countries, a day like this could run you $2,000. But here in Sri Lanka, you can pull it off for less than $100. Alright, back to business. On this episode, our focus is going to be on the historic and religious sites of Sri Lanka. We'll start at Sigiriya, an ancient rock fortress. Next, we'll head to Mihintale, the cradle of Sri Lanka's Buddhist past. We'll then take a break and eat a farmer's lunch of delicious Sri Lankan dishes. From there, we'll drive to the Buddhist stupas of Anuradhapura. Then, we'll visit the ancient ruins of the kingdom at Polonarua. After that, we'll check out the cave temples at Dambulla and the modern tower at Ambuluwawa. Finally, we'll go on an elephant safari at Waskamua National Park. Look, I know these are a lot of complicated names for people who are not originally from South Asia, but trust me, you will be able to follow along. I've made sure to label the video throughout, and we'll even do a recap halfway through, so you'll know exactly what you're seeing. Let's get into it. Our first stop is the most dramatic site in Sri Lanka, the ancient rock fortress of Sigiriya. Sigiriya is located almost exactly at the center of the island. If you only have time to go to one archaeological site, this should be it. Sigiriya was built over 1,500 years ago. No one knows exactly who built it, but the most interesting story is that the palace was built by a power-mad king. And if you think you've got problems with your family, then this story is going to make you feel a lot better. The king first took power by burying his own father into a wall. Scared that his brother would come back to take revenge, the king ordered that this fortress be built on top of the rock. The brother did attack, and the king ended up losing. So it turns out that good guys do win sometimes. The site was built 1500 years ago, and about 800 years ago it fell into disuse and was swallowed up by the jungle. In the 1800s, the British started to excavate the area. Eventually the Sri Lankan government took over the project, and now it's turned into a visitor attraction. Sigiriya is a popular destination for local families, Buddhist monks, and even monkeys. Be careful around the monkeys, by the way. If they think you have food, they will fight you for it. And the easiest way to ruin your holiday is to get in between a monkey and his lunch. You can and should climb to the top of Sigiriya using a network of metal and wood stairways. Don't worry, they're perfectly safe. The hike is hard though. It'll take around an hour to get to the top if the site is not crowded. At the beginning of the hike, you'll see two enormous lion paws at the base of the stairs. This is all that remains of an old entrance that used to exist here. The lion head has since collapsed. As you walk to the top of Sigiriya, you might encounter some Sinhala writing carved onto the walls. But wait, don't touch these. They were carved into the walls by visitors over a thousand years ago. One verse, written to a lover, reads, May you remain for a thousand years, like the figure of the rabbit, the king of the gods painted on the orb of the moon, though that, to my mind, be like a single day. So romantic, right? This verse contains an allusion to a Buddhist fable. According to Sri Lankan myth, the Buddha carved patterns on the moon that resemble the face of a rabbit. 
And so that's what the line, the King of the Gods is referring to. You can also see rock paintings of beautiful palace women along the way. At one point, hundreds or even thousands of these frescoes probably existed on Sigiria. Today, only around 20 remain, so you're not allowed to photograph or film these paintings. At the top of Sigiria rock, you'll see four acres or around two hectares of ancient ruins. If you look closely, you can make out outlines of the palace, gardens, and even individual houses. Taking in the unobstructed views from the top, you can get a sense of just how this fortress and its king towered over the countryside. These are the vibes. Our next stop is Mihintale, revered as the spot where Buddhism was introduced to Sri Lanka. Buddhism is the religion of about 70% of Sri Lankans. The Buddha was born 2500 years ago in Nepal. He was a wealthy prince, but he gave up the throne when he was exposed to human suffering as a young man. The Buddha realized that through meditation, virtue, and good behavior, you can achieve salvation. Buddhism quickly spread around India. And about 2200 years ago, an Indian Buddhist king sent his son to Sri Lanka to spread the faith. The name of the Indian missionary is Mahinda, and the word Thale means plateau. So the word Mihintale means plateau of Mahinda, or plateau of that missionary. Mihintale was the place where that Indian missionary met the local Sri Lankan ruler and converted him to Buddhism. This set the foundation for the rest of the country becoming majority Buddhist over time. It's a popular pilgrimage site, and you can climb to the top of the rock for some great views. It's a tough and slippery climb though, and always crowded. You cannot wear shoes, and I almost fell off three times, which was sort of embarrassing, because there were a lot of small children there who did not seem to have any problems climbing up to the top. At the top, you'll see a large white stupa on a nearby hill. A stupa is a Buddhist mound, and it's usually built to hold a relic of some sort. Stupas are very common in South and Southeast Asia. They're different than temples, by the way. Stupas are not hollow, so you cannot go inside them, but they are still sacred places. The stupa at Mihintale was built to house some of the hair from in between the Buddha's eyebrows. Please treat these religious sites with respect. Take off your shoes and wear full-length clothing when you visit. Do not make a lot of noise. And also, don't take a selfie with an icon of the Buddha. Turning your back to the Buddha is considered disrespectful. All right, after climbing Mihintale, you're hungry and you've earned a good meal. It's time for lunch. We're now heading to a farmer's house where we'll enjoy a buffet of dishes cooked the traditional way over a wood-burning fire. When you're in Sri Lanka, you should do one of these rural buffet lunches, especially if you're part of a group. They're not that expensive and you'll get to sample food and ingredients that you'll never get at home. Uh, one of the staple foods in Sri Lanka and then dal of course and pumpkin and then you have cassava or you call it mayok and this is bitter goat which is very good for uh, diabetes and then you have pumpkin. I also encourage you to try some rice and curry. It's a simple dish but the national classic. It's a bit like getting a burger in the US. I had mine cooked fresh in front of me. The ladies first sauteed mustard seeds in oil until the seeds started to crackle. Then they added several spices and vegetables to the mix. Next, yellow pulses or dal were added. And the final ingredient was coconut milk. Mix it up with some rice and you've got a hearty meal. Now, our next stop is gonna provide answers to the two most important questions you have in your mind right now. First, why did that lunch taste so good? And second, how did the modern world come to be? We're heading to a spice garden. The age of discovery was kicked off in the late 1400s by the Portuguese. When Vasco da Gama showed up in India, after rounding the continent of Africa, Arab traders were shocked to see Europeans this far from home. The Arabs asked these men what they were doing in South Asia, to which one of da Gama's crew gave that unforgettable response. We come in search of Christians and spices. In the Middle Ages, the spice trade from east to west was monopolized by Arabs and Jews in the Middle East. So the cost of black pepper and cinnamon in Europe could reach the price of gold. So what did this do? It pushed investors and explorers to take risk. Christopher Columbus sailed west, Da Gama sailed south, but it was all for the same reason, to find another route to the riches of the east. Over time, the European powers established trading posts in Asia, and then just took over completely. The Dutch controlled the Sri Lankan coastline for around 150 years. And one Dutch governor of Ceylon, which is what Sri Lanka was known as back then, called Cinnamon the bride around whom all of us danced. The cinnamon plant is native to Sri Lanka, 
And this small island is still responsible for almost 90% of global cinnamon production. Most spice gardens do have tours, and they are worth it. It's a unique experience to be able to touch, smell, and taste the origin of the products you'll typically just see in bottles from the grocery store. I was given a tour by a delightful man, who also gave me some great life advice. Now, if you want to stay healthy, man, take our food, twice walk, thrice laugh. Laugh means not laughing in the street. Be happy. It's good advice worth remembering. Next, we're heading to Anuradhapura, an ancient capital city of Sri Lanka. Anuradhapura was one of the most important cities in Sri Lanka for hundreds of years. Think of it a bit like Kyoto in medieval Japan. It was the center of Sri Lanka's cultural and religious life for hundreds of years, since even before the birth of Christ. Our first stop in Anuradhapura is the Ruanweli Seya Stupa. Remember, stupas are mounds that often house important relics. When I was there, I was lucky enough to see an important religious ceremony, where people come to wrap fabric around this stupa. The area around Ruanweli Seya Stupa is full of monkeys, and like me, they're cute but aggressive. Some devotees will feed them rice or vegetables, but these cheeky chaps will even steal flowers out of your hands if they can. Our second stop at Anuradhapura is Abhaya Giriya. This is an old stupa, it was built even before Christ was born, and it was the seat of a university of sorts for thousands of monks. Our next stop is another site of historic ruins, Polonadua. Polonadua has shrines, palaces, and other ruins. It's spread out over a huge area, but you can rent a bike to get around more easily. The site was even the location of a 1980s music video by Duran Duran, which helped boost tourism to Sri Lanka. Polonarua replaced Anuradhapura as the major city in Sri Lanka in around the 10th century AD. The city was built up by a Tamil dynasty. For some context, there are two major ethnic groups in Sri Lanka, the Tamils and the Sinhalese. Tamils originate from South India. Today, the country of India actually has a state called Tamil Nadu, which is where most of this ethnic group resides. Tamils have come from this part of India to Sri Lanka over many waves and over hundreds of years. Today, around a quarter of Sri Lankans are Tamil, one way or another. But there are important divisions even within the Tamil and Sinhalese communities in Sri Lanka. So first, let's take a look at the Sinhalese. About 75% of Sri Lankans today are Sinhalese, and almost all Sinhalese people are Buddhist. Now, the Tamils. There are three groups of Tamils in Sri Lanka. The first group are the Ceylon Tamils. Remember, Tamils came to Sri Lanka over many waves and over hundreds of years. Ceylon Tamils were in the first waves. They arrived even before the Europeans did. These people conquered much of the island and built the city of Polonarua around 1100 years ago. Today, they're mostly found in the north and east of Sri Lanka, as well as in Colombo, which is the commercial center of the island. Ceylon Tamils are well educated. They're mostly Hindu, but some have converted to Islam. By the way, these Muslim Tamils, although they're ethnically Tamil and they speak the Tamil language, don't identify as Ceylon Tamils. They identify as Muslims, a completely separate group altogether. So the first group of Tamils are the Ceylon Tamils. They arrived several hundred years ago, they're found mostly in the north and east, and they're mostly Hindu. The second group are the Muslims, and the final group are what are called the Plantation Tamils. See, in the early 1800s, the British decided they liked Sri Lanka so much, they would keep it. The Brits turned much of central Sri Lanka into tea plantations. Central Sri Lanka, what used to be the Kingdom of Kandy, is hilly and cool, making it perfect for growing tea. But the British needed people to pick the tea, and they were not about to do it themselves. So what did they do? The Brits went to South India, and they imported poor Tamil laborers to pick the tea in central Sri Lanka. These people are that third group of Tamils, the plantation Tamils. So while the Ceylon Tamils, who arrived about 1100 years ago, are the educated and economic elite of the country, the plantation Tamils are the lower class. As far as I know, Sri Lanka may be the only country in the world where the same ethnic group comprises both the upper class and the lower class. Looking at a census from 1911, we can see that Muslims were about 7% of the country, and Ceylon and plantation Tamils are about 13% each. If you add that up, it means that around a third of Sri Lanka was Tamil in 1911. The Sinhalese are the other two-thirds. Looking at the religious composition from around the same time, you can see that most Sinhalese are Buddhist and most Tamils are Hindu. In 1948, British rule ended and Sri Lanka became independent. During the independence struggle, the relationships between Ceylon Tamils and the Sinhalese were actually pretty good. Both sides worked together. 
But neither the Ceylon Tamils nor the Sinhalese liked the plantation Tamils, the newer arrivals. The Sinhalese were scared that they would be outvoted and that the poorer plantation Tamils would support Marxist groups. The Ceylon Tamils also didn't really see the plantation Tamils as the same people. The plantation Tamils were poorer, they lived in different areas of the country, and they were from different Hindu castes. So in 1949, just one year after Sri Lanka declared independence, the parliament stripped plantation Tamils of their citizenship. This really hurt. Just as Sri Lanka was becoming independent and starting to allocate resources, plantation Tamils were completely cut out of the process, and this doomed them to poverty for generations. Eventually, hundreds of thousands of plantation Tamils ended up deported back to India. Their proportion of Sri Lanka's population is only 4% in 2012, compared to the 13% it was a century earlier. All remaining plantation Tamils finally received Sri Lankan citizenship only in 2003. The Ceylon Tamils were having different problems though. They were seen as too powerful. This is because during the British period, the Ceylon Tamils received an excellent education, primarily in English missionary schools in the north and east of the island. As a result, they came to dominate the civil service, despite being a minority. After independence, this continued, which angered the Sinhala majority. Government jobs were the best jobs around. It's not like Google was hiring anyone in Colombo in 1948. So in 1956, Sri Lanka's parliament switched the official government language from English to Sinhala. The Tamils, who only could speak Tamil and English, were fired from their government jobs and replaced by Sinhalese people. Communal violence started to erupt. In the 60s and 70s, Ceylon Tamils faced even more problems. A new constitution named Buddhism the state religion. Remember, most Tamils are Hindu, not Buddhist. Next, Tamil cultural exports were banned. And a new affirmative action program meant that Tamils had to score higher than the Sinhalese on exams to get a university seat. Tamils now started to leave Sri Lanka. One example of this is the family of the Canadian actress Maitreya Ramakrishna. She's the star of a Netflix teen comedy called Never Have I Ever. If you listen closely to her interviews, she does not identify as Sri Lankan, but just as Tamil Canadian. Many diaspora Ceylon Tamils harbor resentment towards the Sri Lankan government because of how their families were treated post-independence. In the 1970s, the Tamils who were left in Sri Lanka started to form many armed and peaceful resistance groups. The most important of these were something called the Tamil Tigers. The Tigers fought and defeated the other groups and would even assassinate Tamil politicians who wanted a peaceful resolution to the ethnic conflict. The Tigers had one goal. They wanted Sri Lanka to be divided into two countries, with the North and East becoming a Tamil homeland. In 1981, a Sinhalese mob burned a library in Jaffna, which is a Tamil-dominated city in the north of the island, destroying many cultural artifacts. In 1983, the Tigers killed 13 Sri Lankan soldiers. And with that, the Sri Lankan civil war had begun. Suicide bombings and political assassinations were commonplace in the 1980s. One of my guides in Sri Lanka told me that when his mother and father were leaving home or coming back, the mother and father would each take a different bus so that in case there was a bus bombing, at least one parent would come home to take care of their family. It was that kind of war. India, the regional power, was keeping a close eye on all of this. In the 70s and 80s, the Indian equivalent of the CIA provided some aid to the Tamil Tigers. But in 1987, the Prime Minister of India signed an accord with the President of Sri Lanka. This agreement ended India's support for the Tamil Tigers, and it actually sent Indian soldiers to Sri Lanka as peacekeepers. This peacekeeping effort was a complete disaster. The Tamil Tigers refused to disarm, and now started fighting the Indian peacekeeping forces. A lot of Tamil civilians were caught in the crossfire. The Sri Lankan government grew to resent the presence of Indian forces so much that the Sri Lankan Sinhalese dominated government started to send weapons to the Tamil Tigers to push the Indian forces out of the island. Finally, after 32 months, the Indian government pulled its troops from Sri Lanka. In 1991, a Tamil Tiger suicide bomber killed the former Prime Minister. That PM, Rajiv Gandhi, was campaigning for his old job back, and the Tigers were scared that if Rajiv won, he would send Indian troops back to the island. So, a female suicide bomber approached Rajiv at a function with a flower garland. Garlanding politicians is a very common thing in South Asia. But this garland had a bomb, and it detonated. In 1993, 
The Tamil Tigers also killed the president of Sri Lanka. Over the next few years, the Tigers blinded a prime minister of Sri Lanka and assassinated many local politicians, both Sinhala and Tamil. Mediation efforts always failed, as the Tigers were never interested in peace. Finally, in 2009, the war ended, with the Tamil Tigers leader killed in battle. Hundreds of thousands of people died, and over one and a half million Tamils left Sri Lanka during this 26-year-long civil war, robbing the country of much of its human capital. Today, thankfully, relations between Hindu Tamils and Buddhist Sinhalese are a lot better. Okay, before we head to the next site, let's do a quick recap of the places we've been to so far. In order of the time when they were built, we have First, Mihintale. This is where an Indian missionary introduced Buddhism to a Sri Lankan king. The reason it's significant is because it set the foundation for the religion that about 70% of Sri Lankans follow today. Next, Anuradhapura. This was built around 2200 years ago, and it was the island's political and religious center for a thousand years. Then, Sigiriya. This is an ancient rock fortress that a king built about 1500 years ago to protect himself against invasion. And finally, Polonarua. This was built around 1100 years ago. It became the center after Anuradhapura decline. It was built by Ceylon Tamils, who invaded Sri Lanka from South India. See, I told you you'd be able to follow along. All right, now we're heading to Tambula, a set of cave temples that are 2000 years old. Tambula has several caves with paintings and statues of the Buddha. One cave alone has over 1500 paintings. The monastery still functions as a religious site, and you'll probably see people praying when you're there. Our next stop looks like some crazy Dr. Seuss type creation. I'm talking about Ambuluwawa Tower. And unlike the other sites on this episode, this wasn't built a thousand years ago. It was built in 2006. It's quickly jumped to become one of Sri Lanka's most visited sites. The views from the top are spectacular, as the surroundings are a biodiversity complex. And as with any good Sri Lankan attraction, there's a statue of the Buddha waiting for you at the top. There are a lot of national parks in Sri Lanka, and if you have time, do a safari. Our next stop is West Gamua National Park. The quality of these safaris is not going to be as good as the ones in Africa, but the prices are lower and everything is convenient, just given how small Sri Lanka is. The most popular safari site is in Yala, which is on the southern coast, but I went with West Gamua in the center of the island. There are over 400 species of birds in Sri Lanka, but the star attraction on a safari will be the elephants. Asian elephants are a bit smaller than their African cousins and less likely to have tusks. They gather near watery areas and you're guaranteed to see some of them in Sri Lanka. Friends sometimes ask me whether a safari is worth the money and the hassle. And my answer is that it absolutely is. Seeing an elephant or a leopard in a zoo just doesn't compare. The animal is bored and you're bored. But seeing these creatures in the wild without cages is a much different experience. It's such a treat to observe herds of elephants and especially to see how they interact with their babies. Thanks again for tuning into Destin Travel. We hope you enjoyed this episode, which covered the historic and archeological sites of Sri Lanka. Make sure you hit the like, subscribe and notification icons for more videos about Sri Lanka and other destinations around the world. Thanks again.